Good morning, everybody. Hello. How are you doing? Um, just checking you can all see and hear me okay. If anyone can give me a little thumbs up or a, a yes in the chat, that would be great. Fabulous. Thanks, Jose. So I can see people continuing to stream in. And uh, I was just reflecting as I was seeing the welcome messages in the chat box on what a miracle it is really to be alive at this time in human history. With all its challenges, the fact that we can do this through a virtual space, our online Dharma Hall, it's quite miraculous. It's a kind of uh, magic, I think. And I know many of you will resonate with this, but the, there's something very special about sitting with others, you know, and in person or here, supporting each other in practice around the globe. So just welcoming you all from lots of different countries and places today. <clears throat> so as the last few people stream in, just making sure you have everything you need so that you're comfortable, cozy, well set up for today's practice. And also just always this gentle reminder um, that your presence here is a great support. It supports the rest of the community, the Sangha. It's by being here, practicing together, whether you're live or doing the recording, it's this great support, this coming together, in the Sangha. And also, if you're able to support by offering dana, if you can donate, really just keeping what Sangha Live is doing going, keeping it thriving, the community going. And when you're able to offer dana, it supports everybody else in their practice. So it's a kind of offering of kindness, of generosity, and a kind of compassion as well, I think, to others. So uh, George has put the link in. Thank you saved me doing it. <laughs> but we appreciate, Dana, if you're able to offer it, we just appreciate your presence here as well. So. <clears throat> so we're moving forwards throughout this week with our topic of hindrances and habits, or obstacles might be a better word. And as the week goes on, I'm going to give more and more detail referencing uh, suttas, uh, traditional texts, but also stories and poems that hopefully will help bring a lot of this teaching to life and make it really present for you. So yesterday we kind of took an overview of these five obstacles and today I just want to take a moment, if it's okay with you, to go into where we actually find this in the suttas. So I'll, I'll share um, a little bit of a, a reading with you. Um, and I'm also going to, I know some of you are quite um, keen on textual references, so I'm going to paste the sutta that I'm reading from here in the chat. Here it comes. And so there's many references in the traditional texts which talk about the five hindrances, but um, one of the key ones is this, the Anguttara Nikaya 551, um, sometimes called the Book of Fives which has this very mysterious, magical sound to me when I think of it, the Book of Fives. So, in a very simple way, this is a very simple translation. It goes like this. <clears throat> On one occasion, the Buddha was near Savati in Jetta's Grove at Anathapindika's monastery. He addressed those gathered to hear the Dhamma. Friends, there are five hindrances that overwhelm mindfulness and weaken wise discernment. Sensual desire is a hindrance that overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. Ill will is a hindrance that overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. Laziness and drowsiness is a hindrance that overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. Restlessness and anxiety is a hindrance that overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. 
doubt and uncertainty is a hindrance that overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. These are the five hindrances or obstacles. And so this simple repetition that often comes from oral traditions, you know, repeating certain phrases, we have a lot of that in the suttas, this repeating of the phrases in one sense helps to remember and provide lyricism in oral traditions, but it also really drives home kind of why it's helpful to work with these five hindrances. It overwhelms mindfulness and weakens wise discernment. And I'm pretty sure if you're here, you aspire to be more mindful, more discerning, more wise. So the hindrances are one way into that. Now, the sutta continues and the Buddha offers a wonderful simile that involves a river. And some of you know I love rivers and I love the idea of water. So this story goes like this. Imagine or visualize a great, vast, flowing river that flows down the mountains, through the fields, and to the ocean. The current is strong, robust, powerful, and it's really going somewhere. And because it's strong and robust, the flow of the water can carry many things. It can carry away debris and flotsam, things which aren't needed. But it can also carry boats, materials, people. Now imagine that someone came to the banks of the river and they created irrigation channels that separated and branched off from the river to take the flow of water somewhere else. If there were many of these channels, the flow of the river may slow down. It may not go as fast or as far. It may not be as powerful in its way of moving forwards. Now imagine somebody else comes along. They didn't like what the first person did and they close the irrigation channels. They mound them up, they dam or shore up those irrigation channels once more. And the river once again flows with its great mighty strength towards the ocean. So the irrigation channels represent the hindrances. The hindrances weaken the flow of presence, of mindfulness, of our flow towards all the things we might aspire to through our meditation practice. So when we can acknowledge, soften, maybe even close down those hindrances, our concentration can move forwards with great strength and great vigor. So if that image is helpful to you, you could uh, consider that today. And before we sit, we'll talk just a little bit about the first two obstacles. So yesterday, this first one, sense of desire, craving, wanting, specifically it's referred to as sensual desire, really centered in the five senses, the five senses and the sixth sense of the mind in the Buddhist traditions. And really what it describes is our constant feeling that pursuing these five senses, the pleasures of the senses, can lead to lasting happiness and comfort. And of course, they're impermanent, they change. The Buddha likened sensual desire to taking out a loan you enjoy something that feels really good. You increase your dopamine or you increase your pleasure. But like a loan, there's always a bit of a debt to pay. And often if there's compound interest, the price of the pleasure isn't worth what it costs in our peace and our tranquility. So that's one uh, way of looking at sensual desire, like a loan. <laughs> Another way that's offered is to imagine looking out of a window. You look out of a window, engage with the outside world, really engage with the senses. This isn't bad, this is wonderful. 
But by closing off and settling down sensual desire, just for a short period in the practice, it becomes like we're looking at a mirror. So it's given that this is the difference between looking out of a window, kind of reaching outside of myself to get something enjoyable, tasty, pleasurable, or just letting that be there and looking in a mirror and seeing who I really am. And now for each of these obstacles, there are antidotes or remedies. As we go through the week, I'll offer the remedy or the antidote for each hindrance. On the Friday, we'll look at doubt, one of the big ones, and how we can really acknowledge and work with doubt and find an antidote. So the antidote that's given to sensual pleasure or sense desires <clears throat> is simply to let go of excess concern for comfort, pleasure, and bodily pleasure and comfort. Now, I don't think this means that we disregard ourselves or don't look after ourselves. But in the little bubble world of our practice, when we're sitting, meditating, it's for a little while, allowing that to not be so important. Make yourself as comfortable as possible, but also understanding that comfort is temporary. It's changing. And so we align to the stillness, to the presence of our practice, and let go a little bit the concern for bodily pleasure and comfort. So that's one of the remedies or antidotes in this case for sensual desire. And the second obstacle, often translated as ill will, ill will covers things like genuine resentments, hatreds, angers towards other people, towards ourselves, but also situations where we push things away because we don't like them, aversion and ill will. And so the Buddha likened aversion and ill will to being sick. When we're really, really unwell, really struggling with an illness or disease, it can often deny us our sense of happiness or freedom or peace. Now, the antidote to this is metta, loving kindness and compassion. That if we're able to offer ourselves and others a little compassion or friendliness, if you prefer that word, that can really be an incredible remedy and antidote to aversion and ill will. And when this hindrance settles down, we're more able to move into a place of peace, a place of freedom, and a place of happiness. So, it's just a little overview. But the best way to learn of these things really is through your own experience in practice. So shall we do that now? Shall we uh, sit or if there's a posture which is more appropriate for you, be standing or lying down, you can also do that. So, <clears throat> that familiar friend posture. <laughs> Each time we take the meditation posture, a sense of returning to something familiar, returning home. And to this wonderful refuge of practice. And I'll ring the bell to begin. In the process of arriving into posture, 
is an ongoing process. But you might sense into what feels steady or stable in your body right now. You might sense the contact points of the ground, cushion or chair. And gently receiving that support, that contact. You might sense and trust in the expansiveness of ground beneath. And the steadiness and expansiveness of awareness, like the ground reaching out. You might sense if there's anything in the muscles of the body that may soften, may release a little bit. Opening up to space, space that's here. And an invitation to sense what's really alive in the field of your awareness right now. What are you noticing? What's here? And now an invitation to 
generally engage with any sense of the first obstacle that might be here? Is there any residue of desire, sense desire, a wanting, a longing? And take some time to notice. Keep sensing into anything that's pulling you and drawing you away. And if you sense something, desire, sense desire, what would it be like to locate it in the body? Is there a physical sensation or area that connects to this sense of desire? Let's spend a little time really knowing how this first hindrance expresses itself in the body, the feelings, the sensations. And if it's absent for you today, really noticing and feeling the absence of sensual desire.
And there might be a little curiosity as to why we feel the need to leave these sensations. What can't we be with in the longing, in the feeling of desire? Why is it hard to stay? If you notice the desire to change this, to fix something, to judge something, is there a way to simply soften and allow things to be the way they are? This is the way it is right now. We'll continue to practice in silence for the remaining time. You might continue noticing this particular inquiry around desire, or perhaps expanding awareness to include other or all hindrances, obstacles. We keep returning over and over to the experience in the body.
these last few minutes, you may choose to offer yourself a little compassion, metta. You could offer gentle phrases to yourself. May I be safe. May I be happy, healthy. May I be at ease. And as we draw to a close, I'll offer a poem and then the sound of the bell. This poem is by Wendell Berry. It's called A Timbered Choir. I go among trees and sit still. All my stirring becomes quiet around me like circles on water. My tasks lie in their places where I left them asleep like cattle. Then what is afraid of me comes and lives a while in my sight. What it fears in me leaves me and the fear of me leaves it. It sings and I hear its song. Then what I am afraid of comes. I live for a while in its sight. What I fear in it leaves it. And the fear of it leaves me. It sings and I hear its song. It sings and I hear its song. So you might take a moment to stretch out a little bit, if that's helpful. It's coming back into more visual sense if your eyes have been closed for practice. And so I'm gonna offer something I touched on yesterday which is that when you're newer to the practice, really working with these obstacles can be very helpful, knowing that it's part of the process. The more that we practice, the more consistent and regular the practice is, the more the tendency is for those obstacles to settle down by themselves over time. And then we might find there's more spaciousness, 
the ability to concentrate more clearly without distraction. And those of you who've practiced a lot, I know it's many of you, there's this word that in some senses feels like it's a little bit taboo to talk about it in the practice. I don't know why that is, but this word jhana, jhana. So if you've not come across this Pali word before, it's different interpretations of what jhana is, different expressions of it. But largely it's a very highly concentrated state of mind. State of mind that is so stable, so focused, so concentrated, that there can be a total absorption with the object of meditation or in a more general open way. Jhana is a topic for another time, I think, but it's quite clear in the suttas that jhana is not possible with the presence of the hindrances. What I've been taught, what I've learned, everything that I've found, in the text it indicates that the jhana occurs when the hindrances are absent or almost not there. And so learning to notice their absence is also really important, as I mentioned yesterday to, to someone in the chat, that knowing that experience of, oh, actually I'm wanting for nothing right now. Actually, I'm very okay with being where I am. There's discomfort in my leg, in my body, but it's not a problem. <laughs> and so, I'll open to questions in a moment. Um, but habits, how does this exploration of sense, desire and ill will relate to contemporary understanding of habits? What I want to offer is one technique, two perspectives. So there's a very simple technique if you're looking to try and break a habit that's not helpful. And you probably know it, but it's so simple you might overlook how powerful it is. And the technique which has been helpful for me over the years is this. Say there is a desire for something. There's something you're clinging to, a habit that you would like to break or disrupt. When you notice the desire to reach out for that thing, look at the clock, say, in 10 minutes, if I still want this, then I'm going to have it. <laughs> and so you wait, 10 minutes passes, and then you reevaluate. It's not kind of a free license. Okay, I've done my 10 minutes, now I'm going to go wild. But give yourself 10 minutes and then reevaluate. What if I did another 10 minutes? Okay, so 10 more minutes. And if I really, really want this thing still, if I really want to do this thing or whatever it is, then in 10 minutes I can. And often what we find is that if we can ride it out for 10 minutes, we'll kind of trick ourselves a little bit into just staying with what's here, not reaching out straight away. Often you'll find that the desire subsides. Temporarily, of course, these things come and go. But it's surprising how useful this can be for kind of day-to-day -day habits or cycles that you're looking to break. 10 minutes, reevaluate. And so the second perspective is to think about friction, what we call friction with habits. So an example of this is, say if I was a smoker and I was looking to quit smoking, I can put friction between me and the habit by making sure I never have cigarettes or lighters or anything like that in the house. It makes it that little bit harder for me to execute that habit. So it's a simple example. We can add friction into the process of habits we want to break. Equally, we can reduce friction for habits we might want to establish. And so an example of this that I really liked was once I was speaking to someone who really wanted to learn to play the guitar. They really wanted that as a habit going forwards. But they had their guitar in its case on top of a wardrobe in a separate room in a spare bedroom. 
And so there was the friction of going into the separate room, taking it down from the wardrobe, taking it out of its case. And even just that silly little bit of very mild friction was enough that this person didn't pick up the guitar very often. So what they did is they took it out, they put it on a stand in the living room, so it was always there. And then it was much easier just to grab and play a few notes. You can do this with your meditation cushion. If you're taking a yoga practice, if you plan to practice in the morning, you can put your mat out, your cushion, your blanket, make it look cozy and inviting. So it's already there in the morning and you've removed as much friction as possible to establishing or continuing a habit that might be positive for you. So you have the 10 minute trick and thinking about how you can use or reduce friction to help change habits. There are two methods. So, uh, questions. Yes, Steph, bear with me. I will, so what we're gonna do is George and I, at the end of the week, will share all the readings. I'm taking a note of all of them. So we'll make sure that you, you get access to them. But I will also um, paste this particular poem in the chat box now. So it's A Timbered Choir by Wendell Berry. So that was today's reading, but we'll give you all of them. So let me check the chat box. If there are any observations as well, it doesn't have to be a question, it could be something that you share that then really resonates with somebody else and there's a connection there. Um, often sharing your experience is nice for you, but it can be really beneficial for others because they might have the same experience or maybe something different, yeah. And as I said yesterday, if there's no questions, I'll talk a little bit more about today's topic, provide some bonus track information, as it were. Okay, so whilst I wait, the um, reason why I offered this particular way of working with habit that I just express, the kind of friction idea, 10 minute delay idea, because it does relate quite nicely with the first two hindrances. Desire, kind of if the things which we desire, sense pleasures are very close by, then it's easier to act out on them. So putting a little bit of friction can be really helpful. A little bit of extra effort, because we have a tendency to naturally want to conserve energy and to maybe not use as much effort, right? It's kind of part of our biology. But equally, when there's aversion or pushing away of things, kind of not wanting certain things, um, that also feeds into this idea of using friction to kind of reduce friction so that maybe meditation doesn't feel very appealing this morning. Can't be bothered. Don't want to. If you kind of reduce the friction, have everything laid out in a very appealing way, then it might make it easier to practice. So I can see some uh, comments and coming through. So I'll just read through. So lovely to see your um, thank you, Steph and Maria. So Layla commenting, how to deal with aversion towards technology. I work with it the whole day and it really gets on my nerves. I've had quite a few thumbs up, Layla. <laughs> Resonance, I think. So, I think in a practical sense, you know, where you're able to remove yourself from technology, which I'm sure you, you try to do, I'm sure where you can do that, where it's possible, do that. But it'd be also maybe interesting or curious to, to dig into what is it about the technology specifically that uh, you have aversion to? Um, it might feel like a very general aversion. Maybe there's a way you can sense into the bodily experience at the time you're engaging with technology. 
and sees it maybe about more specific things. Maybe for one person, technology is difficult because they don't want to hear about all the horrible, terrible things that are happening in the world. Or they don't like that feeling of being always contactable or available. Or maybe it's the way that it makes the eyes feel being on the screen all day. So a good starting point might be to really become curious as to what is it that is aversive? What is it about the technology that's um, not appealing or not enjoyable? And there might be very valid things that come up. But there might be some things which are a little bit more random that maybe you could say, oh, well, actually, there's pros and cons to this technology. And I can see that more clearly. So I can see lots of questions now coming in. <laughs> so um, I can see a message um, about, can you say more on Jana or Jana? Yeah, Jana. <laughs> um, it's a very broad topic. And it's something which, again, I think in some circles is taboo to talk about or not to talk about. Um, but there's definitely a reference in the suttas that this very deep states of concentration um, occur in, I believe, to paraphrase, it's seclusion, a seclusion, a sense of being in a very quiet place where there's no distraction. And where there's no external distraction, a very quiet place, you know, caves, roots of trees, traditionally, um, then the external stimulation is absent. And so the presence of the hindrances becomes very palpable. And eventually, through long periods of sitting, they might settle down, simmer down, and burn themselves out. And if there's concentration on a particular object, breath at the nostrils, um, sometimes people work with these casino discs, these uh, colored discs that you focus the eyes on, different concentration tools. With prolonged concentration and the absence of the hindrances, typically that's when we're told or taught that experiences of jhana can arise. Um, but again, it's a big topic. So I can see more questions streaming in. So a question from Victoria. I found my mind planning in that sitting and then trying to figure out which hindrance it was. Could you say a little bit about that, please? I relate to this. I'm quite a heavy planner. Um, and often what we find, I think, with this is it's a mixture. When I, in my experience, am in sitting and I can feel myself very future focused, very planning focused, there's almost a combination of aversion and desire within that for me. This desire to be doing something else, to be completing things, to getting things done, to making sure my day goes smoothly. But within that desire is the seed of the aversion, right? It's the seed of right now sitting with the discomfort of not doing those things, not getting everything done, my day not going as well as I would like it to. There's aversion in there. I don't want to be with that thought. So for me, it's always a mixture. And one thing that we can remind ourselves is that, you know, in the sitting practice, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, however long, we can remind ourselves before we sit, yes, planning is important. Yes, looking after myself, doing various different things for my comfort and my pleasure is important. But for this set amount of time in my practice, just going to put that down to one side. And the thoughts will probably still come up, but it's that reminder. Yes, I see you, but I'm going to come to you later. Right now, I'm sitting and I'm with my breath or with whatever you're focusing on. A question from Clive, and I can see lots more questions coming in. So I'm conscious of the time. So what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you, Clive, and Heidi, and the others that I can see, I'm going to take a note of these comments, and I'll address them first thing tomorrow um, in, the, in, in the session. Um, just want to be respectful of time, but thank you. Your comments are really appreciated. And not to leave you hanging, but we'll, we'll come to them tomorrow, if that's okay. 
So friends, wishing you beautiful, calm, vibrant energy for the rest of your day, whatever time of day it is for you, wherever in the world you are. Thank you for your presence and for your support. As always, I'm just sharing the Dana link below if you have capacity and you're in a position where you can support, that would be wonderful and deeply appreciated as always. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.